Are trans women women? Are trans men men? This one question seems to have occupied a tremendous amount of contemporary political discourse, with each side of the aisle claiming that their opposition fails to understand the basic fundamentals of reality. Well, guys, gals, lads, lasses, and all that lieth betwixt, by the end of this five-step video guide it will become apparent that trans validity stems not from some esoteric series of reasonings or societal niceties, but instead from valid reasoning that largely stems from how we use a language. If you disagree with this main argument, then I hope that you stick around so that I might convince you otherwise. And if you're already walking and agreeing with me, then I hope that this video might give you the tools to better articulate your own positions. The first part of this video will be establishing a five-step framework that I use to explain trans validity in my college lectures, and the second half will be debunking the five most common arguments against trans validity. Without further ado, let's go! Four, 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 four. Since we use language every day, it might not be readily apparent why we use it in the first place. The answer is pretty simple when you think about it though. Language is used to communicate ideas. Let's say for example we're in a kitchen and I need eggs for my omelette du fromage. I ask Marco to give me two eggs so that he knows to give me these instead of giving me these. While this is all well and simple, there's a much more complicated question that we're going to need to answer, and that is as follows. Why do we use certain words to describe certain things instead of others? Why don't we call these things Florges or something. While there are indeed a ton of historical reasons for the etymologies of different words, the sociological gist of things is that certain words mean certain things because we agree on their meanings. Human beings communicate by using certain words almost as a social contract. If we agree on the meanings of specific words, then we can get more done as a result. What do I mean when I say that the connections between words and their meanings are completely arbitrary? By that I mean that in language we have these things called signifiers in our day-to-day -day lives, and those signifiers indicate meanings, or signifieds, that are agreed upon by certain groups of people. While we don't consciously think about this all that much, the connections between signifiers and signifieds are completely socially constructed. That is to say, no one word has any innate meaning on its own and is only given meaning the moment that certain groups of people agree on its meaning. For example, if I'm in a classroom and ask my students for a frindle, they will all look at me with very puzzled expressions. In this situation, the word frindle is a signifier without any particular signified. However, if I were to begin the semester by telling my classroom, hey, anytime I ask for a frindle, I'm asking for one of these. Then, for the rest of the semester, if I ask for a frindle, and at different times each student in the class gives me a frindle, then, within the context of this classroom, the meaning of frindle is this. Now, in this example, does this mean that the word pencil has lost all of its meaning? No, the students still use the word pencil outside of class. Heads up for a discussion later on, but this calls into question whether or not this labeling of frindle is useful to begin with, and gauging how useful certain words are in certain contexts will be something that we'll eventually dive into. Furthermore, and this is important, if tomorrow everyone on planet Earth simultaneously got hit in the head with a rock, and we all forgot what the word for pencil is, and we all agree to call it a frindle, then this thing is, by definition, universally, a frindle. It has no innate attachment to the word pencil, and is thus no longer a pencil, since no one really uses the term to identify it as such. A quick digressive note on dictionaries. Some people look to dictionaries as though they're some sort of objective arbiter of meaning, but all dictionaries really do is let us know what the general public thinks about a certain word. Just because PogChamp or No Johns isn't in the Merriam-Webster dictionary doesn't mean that those terms don't have meaning within their respective communities. So it's important to remember that just because a word isn't in the dictionary doesn't suggest that it is meaningless, as words and their meanings have changed over time and will forever continue to do so. Okay, so here's a fun question for you guys. Is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? Take a minute to think about this before we move forward in the video. So we've already agreed that the connection between words and their meanings are essentially arbitrary and are based on how we agree to use the words in society. But it's important to acknowledge that the same logic applies to word categories as well. For example, if I were to ask you, is this a machine? You would say yes, because the category of machine carries with it certain implications that we as a society agree upon. However, if we all agree that the category of smelly means something that is black, then definitionally speaking, this is a smelly, smelly phone. So with that in mind, here's a hypothetical question. You're in a kitchen with the great legend Gordon Ramsay, and some new guy has messed up an order. Ramsay then yells, quick, throw me a vegetable, you f 
Ding dong -ki. Being the astute chef that you are, you look around, but the kitchen is barren, all but for this one glowing specimen on your cutting board. What do you do, fair viewer? Do you self-destruct, wondering where one can find an actual vegetable, since your science teacher told you that the globular plant before you is always necessarily a fruit? No, you're a well-adjusted human being, and you're gonna choose to throw G-Rod the damn vegetable. Now, this might be the moment where some of you are going, here we go, look at this chump coming in here, denying basic science. Of course a tomato is a fruit. Look up the definition of the word. It's a plant with seeds. Tomatoes have seeds. Boom. End of story. Tomatoes are always fruits. But here's the thing, as established previously, words and their meanings are an agreement between people. And if we agree that this can indeed apply to categories as well, then we must naturally conclude that in the environment of this kitchen, if you have Gordon Ramsay screaming at you to pass him a vegetable, and both you and Ramsay identify this thing as a vegetable, then in that moment, a tomato is a vegetable. For those of you who are still on the fruit train, let me ask you this. If the botanical definition of a fruit is a plant with seeds, then what is the botanical definition of a vegetable? I'll wait. Seriously, I'll wait. Dear viewers, I have some news for you. There isn't really a botanical definition of a vegetable. The term vegetable is almost always used to identify things in culinary settings as opposed to scientifically. So if we take a looky over here at the definition of vegetable, vegetables are parts of plants that are consumed by humans or other animals as food. The original meaning is still commonly used and is applied to plants collectively to refer to all edible plant matter, including the flowers, fruits, stems, leaves, roots, and seeds. Vegetables can be fruits, ladies and gents. Every time I teach this lesson, I'm reminded that our education system is so bizarre that it teaches students to interact with the world as though it were one giant lab. For many of my students, their obsession with defining what a fruit is has distracted them from ever bothering to define the meaning of the term vegetable. So, in conclusion, different words can have various meanings depending on their contexts, which is super important to understanding our next section. And now time for a Billie Eilish intermission. All right, before we move on, here's a fun little game that we're gonna have to play all together now. Hypothetical time. You're out on the town with a friend and you just so happen to see acclaimed singer Billie Eilish in a crowd of people. You tell your friend, holy cannoli, it's a Billie Eilish. But your friend who lives under a rock doesn't know who that is. How would you get your friend to be able to identify Billie Eilish? Like what five or six things based on this picture of her would you use to physically describe her so that you would be able to get your friend to see her? You're not allowed to say she's a singer or whatever. Just try your best to physically describe Billie Eilish for me. I swear this will make sense later on in the video. All right, now that you're done, we can return to our regularly scheduled programming. Now, I know that the very thought of gender as being a distinct category compared to sex will turn some people away from this video immediately. But here's the fun part about this segment. Whether or not you agree with the theorists in question is actually irrelevant, because what is relevant is understanding how people use these terms regularly. Furthermore, it's a useful skill to be able to understand different frameworks that people operate with when discussing complex subjects. So even if you find yourself disagreeing with some of this labeling, just work toward understanding these perspectives for now, and we'll eventually get into how this all ties together with my earlier points. History time. In the 1950s, a chap by the name of John Money decided that it would be useful to differentiate the terms sex and gender. That said, it wasn't until the 1970s that people really started to distinguish between the two terms in a more mainstream manner. This important lady in particular, named Judith Butler, had a theory suggesting that the way that we understand gender norms affects the way that we act out our genders. Here's an example. As a baby emerges from its mother's womb, the doctor exclaims, it's a boy. Despite growing up with relatively progressive parents who avoid pushing strict gender stereotypes on the baby, there are a myriad of ways in which the child will experience the expectations of being labeled as a boy. From their grandfather saying, oh, he's gonna be a little fighter just like his daddy, to the gifts of baseball bats and toy cars, the baby grows up with certain expectations for how its gender is supposed to behave. So when the baby grows a little older and starts watching their new favorite TV show, the Power Rangers, they see the male characters wearing darker colors, like blue and black, and the female characters wearing lighter colors, like pink and yellow. The child sees how the blue Power Ranger talks, moves, dresses, and behaves, and because the child sees themselves in the blue Power Ranger, they start to parrot some of those same behaviors. Surely enough, when the child's parents take them to a clothing store and the child is given access to blue clothes or pink clothes, the child is likely to subconsciously gravitate toward blue because they heavily associate certain behaviors and habits as belonging to the gender that they identify with. And here's where Butler says that something even she admits can be quite controversial. 
She argues that very little of this performative element of gender has anything to do with biological sex. If you take the Power Rangers example, it would be foolish to think that human males naturally gravitate towards blue, since you can find many historical examples of cultures where the norm has been to have men look like absolute queens by today's standards. Butler notes that because we subconsciously behave based on how we perceive the supposed behaviors of men and women, gender is, to a degree, performative. Super important to note, but gender performativity is not the same as gender performance. All people take part in subconscious gender performativity in some way or another, but gender performance is a more conscious process of actually acting out or pantomiming gender, the quintessential example being drag queens and drag kings, who dress up as the gender that they don't normally ascribe to as a form of performance art. If you wish that these terms like gender performativity and gender performance were a little less confusing, don't blame yourself as these ideas get so complex that even gender studies teachers I've run into in academia have made mistakes when presenting them to rooms full of students. Just remember that the truth often resists simplicity, and that we can't just give up when things start getting a little complicated, otherwise we'll never have the chance to learn and grow. So that's why this difference between gender categories and sex categories keeps coming up in public discourse. Gender is useful as a category when we're discussing how we see ourselves and society's expectations of us, whereas sex is useful in a more scientific sense. To be clear, distinguishing gender from sex isn't in any way anti-scientific, but is instead just a different form of categorization. The two categorical definitions can exist at the same time, it's just that which one you're using will be entirely contextual. The definition of female doesn't completely fall apart in a scientific sense just because the word can have two different meanings in two different contexts. When we talk about biological sex, the word female signifies having XX chromosomes, and when we talk about gender, the word female signifies someone who identifies as and has a performative sense of being a woman. Again, even if you don't agree with these definitions, it's important to understand how other people use them, because these ideas have been in circulation for well over half a century now and have become quite mainstream. And remember, if we all agree that this is the definition of gender, then that's the definition of gender. You don't get cool points for still thinking that we have nine planets in our solar system, even if the scientific community now recognizes Pluto as a dwarf planet. Words, meanings, and categories change over time. They always have and they always will, so stubbornly clinging to old definitions of words just for the sake of it only serves to muddle public discourse. To tie everything together, let's jump back to our Power Rangers example from before, but this time there's going to be one major difference. Remember how I told you the story of a baby who emerged from the womb? The doctor said, it's a boy, and was treated like a boy for its whole life? Well, what would happen if this baby, who is biologically male, grew older, was watching the Power Rangers, but saw themselves not in the blue Power Ranger, but instead saw themselves in the pink Power Ranger? This child is what we would call transgender, which etymologically speaking means one whose gender is different than the gender that they were thought to be at birth. I should also note that this is an incredibly oversimplified description of what it means to be trans. Though, if you must know, I did have the CEO of gender themselves look over my script and they thought it was pretty great. Being trans can involve a large series of factors that potentially include dressing and presenting in a manner that is not socially expected, being uncomfortable with the social associations of being aligned with their imposed birth gender, etc, etc. However, no amount of me describing the trans experience in this video will really do it justice. So if you're curious to get a more fleshed out description, the best way to do so would be to listen to the experiences of different trans people. There are many trans creators on YouTube who come from all walks of life, so definitely check them out if you're looking to get a better understanding of what it means to be a transgender person. While for many the idea of transgenderism is pretty darn new, and trans people haven't really been historically acknowledged by many Western societies through media or public discourse, trans people can be found in all parts of of the world in most times in recorded history, from Sumerian priests to Roman emperors to indigenous two-spirit folks. The idea of people walking around the world seeing themselves as a gender that differs from their biological sex is almost as old as the human experience itself. While trans people are slowly becoming accepted in many parts of society, other parts have been far less accepting. However, regardless of how one may feel toward the idea of trans people existing, the question of whether or not trans women are women and trans men are men only has one objectively correct answer, and that is that yes, trans women are women and trans men are men. Because the fact of the matter is, if someone is born biologically male, but sees themselves as a woman, verbally identifies as a woman, fits the gender definition of female, and is addressed by polite society as a woman, then she is, by definition, 
a woman because we use language to identify her as such. The existence of trans people is in no way an attack on science or biological sex, any more than throwing a tomato into your veggie dish is a threat to botanical science. Gender identifiers and sex identifiers can both exist in different contexts, and the existence of one does not invalidate the other. It's also important to remember why we use words in the first place, to communicate ideas. If you are going to meet up with this individual at a restaurant and the waiter asks you, which table shall I escort you to, you would say, I'm at the table where the woman with the dark hair is sitting. In day-to-day -day interactions, we don't label people based on their chromosomes or genitals, but rather on a variety of different social factors. Plus, the label of woman is far more useful than mere simple identification. When we talk about the fact that women face inordinately high levels of sexual assault, do trans women not fall under the category of people who are affected by said issue? Might they, then, not deserve a seat at the table when we're discussing their specific experiences? <laughs> so, to sum everything up, we understand that 1. Language is a tool that we use to communicate with one another. 2. Words alone have no intrinsic connections to any specific meanings. Words only have meanings when those meanings are agreed upon by groups of people. 3. Different words can fall under different specific categories based on their contexts. 4. Some people have found it useful to differentiate between the terms gender and sex, where gender pertains to social identities and behaviors, and sex refers to biology. And 5. Transgender people are those who have a gender identity that conflicts with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Thus, because trans people identify themselves through gender and not biological sex, and society at large identifies and interacts with people through gender and not biological sex, we can therefore conclude that trans identities are indeed valid. Or, in less verbose terms, trans women are women and trans men are men. Ultimately, calling a trans woman a man because of their biological sex is akin to insisting that a tomato is always necessarily a fruit, which wouldn't make you some post-semiotic genius, it would just make you wrong. And here's my hot take, I don't think there's anything problematic about being incorrect about something, so long as you're capable of changing your mind when your worldview is adequately challenged. Alright, let's go over some counter-arguments. Number 1. You can change your name, but you can't change your gender, because that is an immutable trait. Ben Shapiro has made the argument that while changing your name is totally fine, changing your gender is impossible because, to quote him, sex is an immutable trait. Now, I'm not going to go over and reiterate the argument that sex and gender are different because this argument from Ben is just so facetious that I can take it down without having to distinguish between gender and sex at all. Let's return to the Billie Eilish hypothetical from before. When you were asked to describe her, did you say that she had green hair? Even if you didn't, if I asked you right now, colloquially, does this girl have green hair, you would answer yes. Yes, she does. The biological fact that her hair isn't naturally green, nor the fact that her natural hair color is an immutable trait, has no bearing on the fact that you use language to communicate her hair color as green. If you want to live your life as though you're always in a lab, then that's fine, I guess. Just don't be surprised when people look at you funny. Number two, women have a social and biological imperative to reproduce, and since trans women can't give birth, they are not women. This one's easy. There are women who are not trans who can't have children. You wouldn't call infertile women lesser women, or heaven forbid, not women at all. This is just an even sillier version of the chromosomes argument. And in case you're wondering, yes, an actual human being once said the words, the purpose of the social role of women is to facilitate the ability to form a breeding pair with a man. Ugh. Freaking hell, let's just move to the next one. Number three, if trans women are women, then you wouldn't need to call them trans women. You would just call them women. Okay, th this one's pretty easy too. Let's say we have a painting. This is a painting, and this is an oil on canvas painting. Just because I've added a descriptive adjective to the painting doesn't make it any less of a painting. Calling a trans woman trans merely lets you know what kind of woman she is. Again, if this sounds like a really shallow point, I'm only refuting it because apparently internet smart men feel the need to keep making these easily debunkable points in the first place. Number four, trans people are sick and we thus should and entertain their delusions. I'll be completely honest, most of the counter-arguments to trans validity largely stem from this flawed basis. And even if there are some people who argue against trans validity and don't feel this way, it should be noted that if you're staunchly arguing against the validity of someone's identity, you have to anticipate that some people are going to read this as being a tad insensitive. So don't be surprised when trans people come off as a little bit hurt or emotional when they're being asked to justify their own existences. 
It should be noted that there was once a time in history in which women who were interested in fighting for their rights or who were openly promiscuous were labeled as clinically hysterical by scientific communities. Being gay was seen as a mental illness in the mainstream Western scientific community as late as the 90s. We tend to look at those perspectives now as coming from a place of inexperience and ignorance dealing with different types of people, as humanity has the habit of labeling things as wrong or something that needs fixing if we don't fully understand them. I implore you not to fall into this trap though, as the way that your Ben Shapiros and Sargons look at trans people now will be looked at by future generations the same way we look at the bunch of jerks I just previously mentioned. What's even worse is that this take is really frowned upon by the scientific community in actuality, as the idea that there's anything wrong with trans people just doesn't have any scientific validity backing it up. As it turns out, when you aren't bullied into oblivion and belittled by people who are trying to make you seem insane, trans people are likely to live happy and normal lives. If you've ever wondered why the trans suicide rate is so high, that isn't because trans people are more susceptible to mental illness, but instead because they're more likely to be the targets of people like Ben Shapiro and Sargon, who are incapable of not seeing them as monsters. Number 5. If we let trans people into female restrooms, they will attack our women and children. Being trans is unholy. Being trans is an attack on traditional gender norms. Won't someone think of the children? Appeal to emotion fallacy. I can't really rationally engage with these lines of reasoning because in order for me to do so, these arguments would have to come from a rational place, which they do not. I could sit down and explain why all of these lines of reasoning are wrong, but if you find yourself touting these phrases, it probably means that you feel attacked by the very existence of trans people, which, to be clear, is absolutely irrational. Fear and discomfort that is based on emotional responses rather than rational ones is never a valid excuse for condemning people or behaviors. Trans people aren't out to hurt anyone or destroy anything. They just want to live their lives in peace and hopefully be accepted for who they are. And that is something that we can all contribute to in some small way. I sincerely hope that this video may have helped you better understand a whole bunch of things in a different light than you might have otherwise. Feel free to share this video with anyone you feel would benefit from either learning about trans validity or would benefit from being able to better express the idea of trans validity. Good ideas deserve to be spread, and I hope I've been a positive contribution to the discourse, even if it ends up being ever so slight on my tiny, tiny YouTube channel. Push all the buttons if you like video essays, and follow me on Twitch if you want to say hi. Bye everyone!